Howdy everyone, Christine here with the Texas Blockcast with a real treat for you today. I'm sitting here in our studio with Neil Galloway and we're going to be doing a deep dive into the history of Bitcoin mining and some tips about how to break into the space as a career. Neil, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I have to say, you really do put the O in OG when I think of Bitcoiners and Bitcoin miners in the space. I think you've been in this Bitcoin space, the mining space, longer than anyone else I've ever met. So if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about how you got into Bitcoin and then Bitcoin mining. Yeah, absolutely. Um Started very, uh, very much like a hobby, like any other hobby. Um, you know, I, I was on IRC, um, started talking to some people who were discussing Bitcoin. IRC? Um, Internet Relay Chat. Okay. So um, before, before there was Napster, there was Internet Relay Chat. Uh, it's kind of where file sharing was, was born. It was even on dial-up. Um, you would get in there and there would be bots that would be servers and chat rooms, and you would actually download um, from those bots by using uh, command prompts, you know, slash DCC send, and then whatever the, the code was from that server that you wanted. <laughs> so um, this was very, very early on, but um, it was a way for you to get free music, you know, eventually free movies, things like that. That's what intrigued me about it originally. And um, you started seeing a lot of guys talking about Bitcoin on there. Um, and this was when? What year? This was probably around 2013. And, um, well, I'm sorry, that was actually around 2010. And oh my goodness! Yeah, a year and, after. Yeah, launch. and and it was it was very much uh, it was early on. Um, a lot of people were trying to explain it to me, and they were probably giving me very bad advice on it whenever it all came down to it. But <laughs> um, the way that it was explained to me was, you would download this core wallet and run it on your computer, and one day you're just going to get fifty bitcoins in your wallet. Um, <laughs> Just like that. That Magic. was it. Yeah. And and I, I didn't really like, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it because at the time there were no off ramps, right? So um, I was watching this. I was like, okay, explain it to me. How do I put it in my hand? You know, I had, I had all those questions. Right. And nobody could really tell me that part of it, but it was definitely there. Um, you know, I went into these chat rooms and I saw a lot of these, these guys talking about um, – Bitcoin on on the Freenode server. Freenode was kind of where everybody would chat and and talk about Bitcoin. Okay. Um, whenever you would go in there, that was at one time that was actually how they were still confirming transactions was using these IRC channels before there was a lot of computers out there. So the information that we were getting was was very very early on. But what ended up happening was I I. You know, I saw the guys transfer Bitcoin from wallet to wallet, and I was like, well, this is cool, but it, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me at the time because I was I still couldn't figure out how to turn it into money, right? Right, because there was no off-ramps. There's yeah, nothing yeah. you could trade it for or sell yeah. it for. And at this time, there was nobody with, like, memes out there to, to throw at you <laughs> either to, to really help you kind of understand everything, you know? So I was like— This is a monetary revolution. <laughs> right, and and as cool as it sounded, you know, I, I was dealing with my own— um, my own turmoil from from the uh, financial crisis that it had just happened, mm -hmm. you know. So everybody was kind of preoccupied dealing with things. So as I as I as I moved past, you know, the questions, I was just like trying to take care of myself eventually, you know. And I went through the next three years watching things happen. You would see things like Mount Gox, and the price would spike and come down, and then you would see, uh, you know all kinds of different news about Bitcoin, and it, most of it was related to pricing and then falling. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I stayed up on it, but I, I decided I wanted to, like, learn some more about it. I started digging into uh, Bitcoin Magazine. I actually had some articles around um, the the first ASIC chips. Um, I, I think Vitalik was actually writing um, articles back then still. And the only other source besides that was Bitcoin talk. And, you know, this is at a time Satoshi was still posting on the forum. And, you know, you, you could, you know, you would think this was a real person, you know, like, like there was no question in my mind that this was a real person. And then, you know, uh, Vitalik was 
was posting uh, articles about the ASIC chips and um, how it was kind of antithetical to the whole ecosystem because it was against the one CPU, one vote rule. Interesting. So the original computers, the CPUs, they were the only ones mining Bitcoin, but the GPUs as well, weren't they kind of competing? Oh, yeah, yeah. They were, they had, yeah, they had GPUs. It was funny because you would have people with uh, computers um, with the sides taken off and they would have box fans in front of them <laughs> on, on so the GPUs. The prehistoric <laughs> ASIC cooling. Right, right. And, and you know, I, I don't think anybody really expected ASICs to be such a, a huge leap in in hash rate. And whenever we started really getting into it, um, I think it was Avalon came out with the very first manufactured ASIC in that same year. This was 2013, 2014 area. Um, that same year, you started to see, um, I think, Bitmain came out with one, and they were the first ones to actually come to market. But there were some other guys like Butterfly Labs before then, okay. you know, and, and they had pre-sold these miners and everybody was supposed to get these miners and they didn't d- deliver on time. It's, you know, it's kind of an age old story <laughs> in this changed. business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, that's where we started to really get some understanding around, you know, what the Silicon Lottery was and, you know. What is the Silicon Lottery? Um, so whenever you produce a uh, wafer, a, a chip wafer, not all of those chips are good chips. Some some perform oh. better than others, right? Okay. So so whenever you you know an ASIC machine was the first thing where we're going to put a ton of chips on a board and we're gonna we're gonna run these things at, at at their max potential, right? And what what we did was these these ASIC chips. Whenever you get them, you can only get so much capacity from TSMC or Samsung, and usually that capacity is based on the year before. So these new companies coming in to get capacity at these large chip makers, there was only so much they could get. So even if you got bad chips, you just take what you get because you have to use them, right? Wow. And and we still deal with this today. But I imagine compared to the CPUs and the GPUs, even if you got lower in the lottery, you're yeah. probably getting, I mean – much more of a hash rate than... Well, well, this is where firmware and tuning and things like that come in, right? So, um, you know, we, we've we've done quantum leaps since the, the S1s and the, the S3s the, that I'm talking about. But um, the, the hash rate at that time, whenever a miner would come out, um, the S1 came out, there wasn't a lot of S2s out there. Um, by the time the S3 came out was probably six to eight months later. Okay. And then the S5 came out probably another six months later. So whenever we were buying used miners on eBay, nobody really cared about them. Nobody knew about them. But uh, by the time I got my hands on my first S1 in 2014, it was technically unprofitable. So profitability was a complete afterthought whenever you were mining Bitcoin back then. It was just it was literally about just getting access to sats. That's that's all we wanted, you know, and. And the idea behind that was it wasn't really so that you could hodl because this wasn't the mentality back then. You had to share it and you had to you had to bring people into the ecosystem or else it's really not worth anything, right? So would you send Bitcoin as an incentive for c- certain things? Were the yeah. off-ramps developed at that point? This was probably before Bitcoin Pizza Day, right? So they hadn't made the first transaction. When was Bitcoin no, Pizza Day? No, this was after that. Yeah, okay. that was one of the big news things that hit like Mount Gox. Somebody that, bought that, two pizzas that with made, that made me go, wait, what happened with Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody actually right. valued it. Right. So this, yeah. So this was like right after that, uh, you know, you know, so people were still trying to wrap their head around like where the value of Bitcoin came from. Yeah. So um, a, a funny story. I, I actually bought an S1 online. I, I reposted it on Twitter the other day. Um, it was in 2015. I sold this thing. I bought it in 2014. And I remember whenever I bought it, I bought it, I was living in Nashville at the time and I bought it from a guy in North Georgia and the guy sent me a message on eBay and he was just so excited to know that there was somebody close to, close enough to him that he could drive to come and meet me that he <laughs> wanted to come and deliver the miner himself. Wow. And I was like, huh, okay, this is getting interesting. <laughs> so from the beginning, there's this camaraderie around the Bitcoin system. Very much so. System. Yeah, and, and I got into mining because that was the only way to get Bitcoin at the time. That's like that's, right. that's the only way that, like, the only other option out there was Coinbase, and we did not feel comfortable sending money to Coinbase. Why was that? 
um, just because it was new, you know, you, you didn't yeah. know if you could trust it or not, you know, and then there was all this, this hype around like, are they tracking the transactions? Who are mm-hmm. they going to report you to? Is Bitcoin going to be legal next year? You know, so you just didn't know what you were getting into. And and it's, I said that was the only option, but that's not true. There was actually one other option and I don't mean to derail from the other story, but <laughs> um, there was a company called Camp BX, which was the first place I ever actually bought Bitcoin from. And uh, they, they may still have a website up. I'm not sure, but they were kind of the first exchange that I ever saw. And uh, you'll love this. I actually had to go and get a money order and mail the money order to Atlanta. And they had to get the money order and then put the Bitcoin into my account. So no credit cards or there was no such (laughs) thing. No Venmo. They didn't want anything (laughs) to do with Bitcoin at that time. So. (laughs) Okay, so tell me then about your first forays into the mining space. Then. Sure, sure. So, um, (laughs) I was actually working for a company called TreadmillDoctor.com. They are one of the larger uh, retailers of fitness equipment parts. Um, what they do is they, they have a commercial service division where we would go and install and repair fitness equipment all over the place. Um, I actually had, uh, storage units, um, all over the place because we would take and we would sell equipment to people. And then those people would, you know, either, sell me the the equipment very cheap or give it to me in some cases. And then uh, my that was my side hustle. So I would go rent out a storage unit to keep all this fitness equipment in. And while, while I was working on it, I started to realize that I had access to free power in some of these storage units. And <laughs> this was whenever these machines are, you know, three or 400 watts. So it wasn't a lot, lot of power that we were using. But I was like, you know, they they kind of run up my electric bill at home. I was like, so let me let me plug some in whenever I leave at night. And, <laughs> oh my goodness! And I would plug them in, and you know, nobody noticed them because at the time they only had one fan on them. They weren't very big. Uh, I had a few. Were they loud back GPU then? GPU miners. They they were loud enough, but if you had one on and walked in the room, you wouldn't notice it. It was only if you if it turned on or so cut the off. neighboring storage units wouldn't have known there yeah. was a clandestine mining operation going right, on in there. Right. And, you know, at the time I had <laughs> no idea, like, you know, I was doing anything wrong at the time, you know, but what, what ended up happening was um, whenever I would leave at night, I would plug a few of these miners in and I started mining and I started noticing that there were some people that would start accepting Bitcoin. There were there was like a phone app that came up that would tell you who in your area would accept Bitcoin. There was a German restaurant in Nashville <laughs> that would accept it, you know. So I thought it was the coolest thing to be able to go and buy food with Bitcoin. Um, the other side of that was, you know, the the miners themselves. Whenever people would, whenever you would find somebody, even on eBay at that time, um, they would want to send you Bitcoin instead, you right. know. So it was just, you know, it was a different kind of mode. Everybody felt like if we were going to get people into the ecosystem, you had to send Bitcoin. You had to use Bitcoin. That that was the mantra, actually. Everybody was, use your Bitcoin, send Bitcoin to people. So things have really changed. because. A lot. Now it's much more of a hodl focus. It's Nobody wants to sell their Bitcoin scarcity. ever because they all know the Bitcoin pizzas are now that ten thousand yeah. dollars is worth how many million? Right. But back then you were encouraging it as a as a medium of exchange. Right. What were the what was the community like back then? Was it very different than it is now? Were there meetups? There wasn't much of a community. I, I was telling you about the guy that drove up to to bring me my miner, right? Right. So, he was so excited to meet somebody. Yeah, that... So I bought bought an S one from the guy. Uh the guy drives all the way up from North Georgia. I mean it had to be a four hour drive for the guy. There, there's no way he made very much money off of this deal at all, you know. But he just and got to meet another Bitcoin. He even bought me lunch, you know. <laughs> so it was like, you know, in addition to basically giving me the miner for free, he sat down and he told me he was like, and and this is, you know, keep in mind, we weren't really talking about profitability numbers, but he told me anytime you buy one of these miners, just don't ever spend more than a 90-day ROI on them. If you can't pay these things off in 90 days, you don't want to buy them. And I was like, why is that? And he was like, because a new one comes out every six months, man. He said, (laughs) think about it. These old ones, they're going to be dead in no time. And I was just like, that's whenever it kind of clicked for me that, wow, we're really, really early in this. And, you know, the more Bitcoin that I can accumulate at this time, the better. And, you know, to that point, it was was interesting whenever you would meet people because – 
it was so few and far between and and mining was not just it was a niche of a niche right so you had mm-hmm. bitcoin um you know this is 2014 2015 um that's probably whenever the bitcoin meetups kind of first started you know and you would go to one of these things and it was all centered around how to use a wallet how to how to send bitcoin how to receive bitcoin nobody really talked about mining so finding another bitcoin miner was very very rare Wow. Well, you know, you are known for having helped a lot of people get into the space. Yeah. How how would someone who's interested in breaking in learn from the history that you have? Because I'm sure that it has been a journey. Yeah. Right. And it very much has been. Um, you know, I, I worked in fitness equipment for seven or eight years, uh, pretty solid, built a really good reputation for myself. But um, my, my education was actually in IT uh, in networking. So um, I, I, I went to school. It was a CCNA school, but I didn't finish. I never did get my CCNA. So um, and for light, our listeners, CCNA uh, Cisco certified network administrator. So um, this would be a Microsoft certified professional professional path. So um, I think it's probably one of the most useful things that you could have in Bitcoin mining today, honestly. Interesting. If you really want to get into the space and you want to be hands-on with machines, networking is pretty much everything in this business. You have to be able to manage and maintain your operation through the network. Um, it's, it's interesting where we're at in the evolution of the machines because uh, essentially we still control machines on a single machine level. They have a UI, you log into them, you set your pool. Um, That's really not how we should be working with networks in general, right? So um, if you have a lot of network experience, you can apply some of these skills to this. But all of the technology that we were using um, three three years ago is whenever I like to say this really became an industry. Um, Whenever you started to apply these these network techniques to this, it starts to make your life a lot easier, right? So what ends up happening is you have you have a, a mining farm and it's all of the switches are, you know, 10, 15 years old because, you know, it's just there's no reason to put new equipment in there. The miners might, you know, <laughs> they might have something new that comes out next year and these things aren't going to be profitable anymore, right? So you kind of treat everything the same. Um, in 2018 to 2020, it was really a lot of hobbyists just trying to figure things out, you know, trying to figure out how do we make things easier. And the way that we found to do that was through the network level. Um, in 2020, I ended up uh, getting on with Frontier Mining. Um, I took a, it was a part time network technician position. Uh, my education in the space was probably 15 years old. And I remember telling Arlen, um, Hey man, I'm a little nervous. I said, I haven't really, you know, managed a network in a very long time. And my education is probably 15 years old. And he laughed and he said, that's great because all the gear that we're using is probably about 15 years old too. (laughs) So it made me feel a lot better. And that was my realization that like, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of space to move in this industry. And where would you recommend finding training? Would you recommend they go through that program? I know that we're working with Texas State Technical College that's trying to put something together. I got to go down there and see their classrooms. It was so cool because they have like the pneumatic tool heads and the welding class. And it's very hands-on. And so they're creating a classroom to look at the circuit boards and um, everything that you need. But but prior to this, I mean, is there anywhere out there that someone could get that kind of training? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's funny because I like to tell everybody that Bitcoin mining isn't as special as you think it is. You know, it's it's just like any other job out there. Mm-hmm. Your skills that you take from any any trade are easily applicable to Bitcoin mining. Okay. So whenever it comes down to it, it depends on which side of it you want to get into. If, you know, I think the most obvious thing, a lot of people from finance, they try to get into it. And, you know, there's probably more finance people in the space than there are network technicians in the space. Really? Whenever it comes down to it. But we really need more technical people in the space yes. because it's it's a hard hole to fill. And to, to take another step back, um, you, you know, the technical training aspect of it, there's probably... 
uh, the infrastructure side, which would be power, building things out, you know, that's your average construction, your, your electrician, things like that. Once the site's built and it's handed off to a mining operations, that's where things get a little bit unique, right? A site operations tech on a mining farm isn't going to be trained the same way that you would be if you were, you know, a Cisco certified uh, network administrator. Um, you don't need all of the same skills. You need a piece of them. And then you also need a piece of those electrician skills as well. So what I like to say is um, if you can find a telecommunications guy, somebody from a Comcast or an AT&T, those guys make probably the best network techs that you could possibly have in this space. Um, they, first of all, most of them are tired of crawling around in somebody's attic, <laughs> you know? And then second, they have all the necessary skills that you would need to basically run, operate, and manage a site from that network level. And, you know, it's about, par and at that point, it's just about part of being, being a part of the ecosystem, that, that Bitcoin ecosystem, you know? So you do have to have a love for what you're doing because the network technicians, you know, a lot of these guys, they are... They are taking a cut in pay to do something they love because it's still a nascent kind of a new industry. And they know they could go out there and do other things, but they're really, really doing it for the love of the game whenever it comes down to it. So even before the China ban, there was an interesting thing that happened. Um, Bitmain, uh, it was right as the Z15s were coming out. This was right before the China ban earlier in 2021, I think it was, um, Bitmain had come out with the Z15. The two owners of Bitmain had had a feud and, uh, one of the owners, something happened with the business license and they weren't able to ship anything off of the docks. So that caused a back backlog on a lot of miners that were pre-sold into the space. So even before the China ban happened, there was another incident that happened where, um, the miners were actually stuck in China, right? So what ended up happening was that that caused a bit of a backlog because this was right before the S-19 came out. The Z Z-15 came out, they sat on the docks for I think six months before they were able to ship them, before they came to a, um, a head with the uh, feud between the two owners of Bitmain and they went their separate ways. After that happened, the S-19 came out and everything was, was pretty wild. I remember... Um, and it's funny because I, I feel like a lot of memories are short from that time period because we were all just heads down moving so fast. But um, I remember there was a statement put out by What's Miner at that time because um, they went from using a power supply that could handle 277 volt to 240 volt. And they had put out a statement saying that they had never made miners for the U.S. market and 277 volt was a U.S. voltage. And then... The China ban happened very shortly after that, and a lot of those miners ended up coming to the U.S., and now they needed a 277-volt miner, but they only had power supplies that could support 240-volt. So there was a mad rush on not only infrastructure and capacity that was ready, but um, just like miners go up and down with the price of Bitcoin, as the price of Bitcoin had spiked, China banned it, and then transformers... Uh, containers, all of the infrastructure, it followed the same path that the Bitcoin miners did. So we went from seeing $40,000 transformers to $120,000 transformers. So this increased the cost of all the infrastructure across the board. And the U.S. just was not ready for it at all. Um, because that's what's so striking is that China banned Bitcoin, but the equipment is almost universally made in China. Yeah, at that time. Yeah. And there, I think there was some like uh, manufacturing going on in Malaysia a little bit at the time, which they've moved a lot of it out of there. Um, it was interesting because as all of that equipment flooded the U.S., you know, so did these Chinese companies that were mining as well, you know. Uh, in exile, wanting to stay in the industry. A lot and of them. And Texas saw a lot of the influx. Very much so, very much so. And and I found that really interesting to watch everybody kind of swing from that, hey, we don't make miners for the American market, to, <laughs> hey, guess what? You're the only game in town. <laughs> yeah, we, we really need to make sure we, we change our, our the way that we work with the American market now. Um, you know, and, and I said what's minor, but this was also true with Bitmain. This is also true with Canaan very heavily. These companies, 
they they cater to a Chinese market. And, you know, basically what happened was the North America just kind of caught the overflow of a lot of it for a very long time. Well, whenever all of that that mining shut down, that was a lot of miners that were looking for a home. So they shut down old miners, people that were getting three and four cent power in the wet season, things like that. They they took those old miners out of the racks and then they put them in storage, right? And they were waiting it out or they were trying to send them to the U.S. Well, what ended up happening was all of those S-19s that had just came out, all those E-15s, they already had reserved capacity in the U.S. So all of the miners that came offline during the China ban, there's a pretty good chance that a lot of those older miners never came back online from the S-15, the S-9s, the S-17s. They, they, whenever they came out of the racks, they didn't go back online. So, and you saw the hash price go down quite a bit. Very much so. When yeah. it all came back online, did you notice, was there a difference in the industry? Did it have let's say, a centralizing effect? Have you seen that in the Bitcoin mining space, like a move from the decentralized CPUs to bigger corporations? I would say it's actually more decentralized now because we were seeing a large centralization of hash rate in China before this. You know, I I, I don't want to speak to the numbers, but I mean, it was well over 50% of the hash rate was in China. Isn't that interesting? Which is a threat to the system, actually, because of the 51% attack if they were to all come together. If they coordinate. coordinate. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the same argument that you have with like pools because of the way they proxy the hash rate together and things like that. So, you know, centralization is not good. We we don't want centralization from from any aspect. So whenever it comes down to it, whenever all of that that hash rate came over here, a lot of the old miners, they literally never came back online because all these new miners already had the reserve space. Right. So. Once all these S-19s come into the space and, and we start racking them, I found it really interesting that the things that we were pulling out of the racks were a, a huge, huge variety of miners. So there was InnoSilicon was a large name in, in 2018 as well. Um, they had several different miners. It was a very, very popular brand. Um, they had an A9 and an X8 and, you know, Zcash miners were probably one of their better ones. Um, and then there was also, you know, the Dragon Mint, which was this weird hybrid. It looked like a, uh, it was an S9 with an InnoSilicon. UI on it. So you kind of knew where it was made and where it came from, but you weren't really sure, you know. Um, there's a lot of guys in this space that that probably have fond memories of, of all these different miners. But um, the other thing was FPGA miners. You know, we, we in the US, we had a very big variety of, of different types of things like that. So um, I'm, I'm thinking of one client that I used to deal with a lot. He had these miners called the Fusion Silicon X7s. And they mined three different algorithms, all three of them you've never heard of. They all have coins you've never heard of. But they were a great educational tool. You know, you, you learn so much about mining and frequency and, you know, what you can do with an FPGA compared to an ASIC, you know, so. Have a lot of those fallen away have they become yeah. obsolete because it's it's really focused on the asics that you know the s19 and the you know he, he, the, we, we can get into the bitcoin maxi conversation i guess you know um <laughs> oh, do <laughs> yeah so so i mean like here here's the thing like i you know i don't claim to be a bitcoin maxi by any means because i think that the technology that's produced by some of the older proof of work altcoins is invaluable to what it's done for bitcoin mining in general right but obviously Bitcoin first. You know, right. it's it's okay to dabble and play around with altcoin miners and things like that. Um, I actually suggested to somebody the other day that um, the one of the best miners to learn on is probably the Z9 Mini. Is it's, that true? it's a cheap little miner. You can hook it up. You can run it for, you know, three or 400 watts. It's not very powerful, but you can take it apart, put it back together, mm. really understand like that there's an ASIC chip in there and how it all kind of works together, you know, but whenever it comes down to it, if you're going to mine it, you know, you want to mine Bitcoin, you know, that's, that's really where it, where the most pristine yeah. asset. Tell us a little bit about immersion 
cooling and how <laughs> that evolved in the space. Yeah, so it's funny because I, I get this reputation as kind of an anti-immersion guy. And I, Are I, you? I feel like it's a misnomer because I... I do end up uh, on Twitter arguing with people about immersion a lot. And, you know, I come from a hosting background and co-location. So uh, for me, I need something that works. I need something that works out of the box. And I don't want to put a lot of time into R&D and things like that. I'm not saying that immersion is a bad thing at all. I think it is the future. And I think that it's one of these things that if you have miners in your garage and you want to do a big immersion setup, I think it's great. Um, coin heated. Um, I, I, I see all these guys online like heating their swimming pools and things like that with them. Wonderful. Well, and maybe let's take a step back for any of our listeners that aren't familiar with the conversation. It's this idea that it's immersed in oil, sure. correct? Yeah. And what is the benefits of immersing a It's mining? all about dealing with heat, right? So miners produce a lot of heat, especially air, air-cooled miners. So we produce a ton of heat, which means we have to deal with that heat in some way. On an air-cooled miner, a lot of times we'll use containers. Containers will have large fans in them. Those fans create a parasitic load that's just more power that you're using. Um, Also, on the miners themselves, the fans use power, right? So if we can take those fans off, then we're not going to use as much power. And we can find ways of dealing with the heat by cooling the liquid instead of trying to cool the air that's going into the miner. Now, all that being said, I feel like... There's a place for immersion, and I feel like the the manufacturers are are almost there. Uh, I think What's Miner just came out with the M53, I think it was. Beautiful setup. It's rack mount. I would love to work with that system. You know, I think it's a great idea. Where I start to draw the line is I'm usually working for clients. I have, you know, people that I'm hosting for. They have warranties on their equipment. I don't want to avoid anybody's warranty. I also don't want to do any R&D with somebody else's equipment because they're relying on that to produce rewards. What I've seen personally in the space is that a lot of people that get into immersion, um, in the long run, you're paying for R&D right now. You know, even if you've got it figured out and you're like the best immersion operator in the world, you're still kind of paying for R&D right now. Because it's a relatively new innovation. And the machines aren't really made for it, you know, so. And you mentioned nullifying the warranty once you immerse it in oil. Right. Does that... Yeah, and it can you can even just changing the firmware on the miner can void the warranty. And and you know to speak to that a little bit, um, some of the companies are better about warranties than other. None of them are very good though. So I don't want anybody to get it in their head that they can put a lot of stock into the warranty of these miners because that's not something you can do. I've I've always told people you, you want to buy multiple miners. You know, there's there's reasons behind that. You you have to make sure that you have consistency and security that if one of those miners goes down that you're not left with no hash rate, right? So whenever you start to whenever you start to mine with these, they're not the server in the AWS data center that everybody thinks of. Um, I I talked to Gideon Powell the other day, and I like the terms that he's throwing around uh, using the term load center. Mm. Um, I think that really does draw a, a very good line between what a data center is and what a load center is. Because what we're using in Bitcoin mining, it's not really high performance computing. They're really simple ASIC chips. You know, it's high density you know, it's, it's very, very, very close together. We, we're trying to make sure that we're using as much power capacity as possible in the small space, right? So it really is a load center whenever it comes down to it. And I think that's a good way to kind of differentiate between what we're, what we're doing here. So whenever we are putting that amount of load on, on the, the grid like that, there's other skills that you need that aren't just computers anymore. You know, we need to understand safety. We need to understand OSHA. That's that's where we're really going with this. The the industry is starting to really become an industry and standardize with these things. So, I think that a lot of what we're what we're trying to get out of it now is the standardization of these machines is going to be centered around how we deal with the heat and mm-hmm. how how we deal with the the ROI because i feel like a lot of the immersion people tend to forget that that's a huge investment to put in to tanks and fluids and things like that that you may not be able to use in a year depending on what kind of equipment comes out 
going back to the mentor that you had, the the man that drove all that way to meet you to give you the Bitcoin, he was saying, if you can't get an ROI on it in 90 days. Yeah. And I, I believe that still stands true in some cases, you know, mm-hmm. like whenever we hit the bottom of that market, like I, I'd have to run the numbers and see, but you know, it, it's, it may not be 90 days, but the point still stands. You have to keep it in mind. Like, yeah. You, you've got to get an ROI. Yeah. Yeah. And, and new c- equipment's coming in, coming in, coming in. So. Yeah. We were talking earlier about, um, you know, the guys from Giga, right? Mm-hmm. They have a great setup. They have created... They've actually created an industry inside of our industry that didn't exist a few years ago, mm-hmm. right? And this is the stranded gas. Yeah, so so they're they're doing flare gas. They have they they're actually doing the generators, the mm-hmm. mining containers themselves. You know, these are these are some really smart guys that figured out that there's an industry and a future here that's not just hey we we want to mine some Bitcoin anymore. You know, so what they're doing is is really intriguing. And I think a lot of what gets lost from the Bitcoin mining end is those are going to be the places where we can send some of this older equipment because they're getting that two cent, three mm-hmm. cent power. You know, that's not going to work on grid forever. You mm-hmm. know, so I, I believe what's happening in our industry is everybody's kind of finding a place for everything. But a lot of it's going to be driven by the technology and the type of equipment that's going to come out over the next few years. And we see the push. What's miners going for immersion? We see that Bitmain's kind of pushing that hydro-cooled package where, where we're going to pump water and, and just put uh, heat plates on the chips instead. Yeah. You know, So it's anybody's guess where we're going to be in a year as far as how the manufacturers are going to make the equipment for cooling. Mm-hmm. So I... But you are seeing a shift in that direction or more and more miners yeah, absolutely. going absolutely. And part of that, absolutely. too, is it's easier on the equipment when it's immersed in the oil. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to give all the credit to immersion because there's a lot of really smart firmware guys out there, um, you know, and just to throw a few names out there. Brains has done a good job. Um, uh, ASIC to the moon has done a really good job as well. Um, and I think Luxor is actually just releasing some stuff uh, as well, um, recently. And what they're all doing is they are thinking about longevity and sustainability of these Bitcoin miners and how can we make these things last longer? It's interesting that, you know, the firmware that comes on your miner is so closed off, you know, there's, there's not, it's not open source. So a lot of these guys are they're trying to you know they're trying to hack into it and figure it out for themselves which is why you'll see firmware come out for one control board but not the other control board or they'll have a timeline where they've cracked this one and then they need to crack that one and then all of a sudden bitmain throws them for a loop and puts out a new control board that they weren't <laughs> expecting you know we need to start creating our own over here sounds like it you know and that's that's really what it comes down to is you know no matter what the manufacturers do there's going to be people that are going to try to innovate and iterate on top of what they're doing but until the manufacturers all get together and we create some type of industry standard that tells them that this is how we're all going to interact with each other these are the type of api calls that we're going to use we're never going to get to that place where we can control things from that network level like i was talking about Mm -hmm. you know so i think that that's what's really important is you know the immersion it's great i think we're we're definitely headed towards liquid cooling no matter what but the manufacturers are going to have to kind of get on board with the firmware and and have a little bit more of an open-minded attitude towards what we're trying to do on a larger scale. Yeah, creating it exactly for the need and exactly, exactly. for the immersion. Well, speaking of pioneering, so you have come a long way and the industry has come a long way yes. and you've learned a lot along the way and growing in new directions it seems like you've also learned things that newer industries, like let's say high performance computing, AI, mm. farms, are going to be able to use what you've done and what you've pioneered. Yeah. Is there a lot of crossover? Is there a lot of reaching out from the AI space for hosting? Yeah, it's interesting because I think we we kind of know each other. Like you know, mm. we, we know who each other are. You know, we we're all kind of dabbling in that same space. But um, I think one of the big things that uh, is going to push that forward is probably people like Intel getting involved in the mining space. Right. Um, 
it's it's really about the way we handle heat, right? Mm-hmm. In in previous in previous years before we got into to Bitcoin mining on on such a large scale, we were really focused on data centers and how many tons of cooling that we would need to cool all of these servers. And that really wasn't what Bitcoin needed, right? Well, it's the same thing with AI. AI is going to need some some different variables that we have to deal with. And I, I do believe that Bitcoin mining and the way that we deal with heat and the way that the immersion's happening so quickly, I think a lot of that's going to feed into the AI technology that they're putting out there. I wouldn't say that we're going to pull ASICs out of the racks and put, you know, <laughs> AI servers in there, you know, but whenever it comes down to it, there's a lot that we can all learn from each other. Yeah. I mean, they're even selling power, you know, whenever it comes down to it, it's it's like render time, right? And I, I don't want to speak to the prices, but I do know it's more than what we paid of mine Bitcoin because it, the processing power costs more, right? So, you know, whenever, whenever somebody wants to process something through an a render farm, they need to pay for that somehow. And it's interesting to see that they're, it's very similar to the data center world on how they're paying for that processing time. What are your thoughts about power? Do you think mm. on-grid is the future or wasted energy, stranded, all of the above? <laughs> I think that depends on regulation. Mm. You know, like whenever it comes down to it, I if – if we can hold back on some of the re- regulation right now, and and I've always been kind of a firm believer of this, especially over the last few years dealing with some of the companies that I have in the energy space, you know, the energy industry has enough regulation on it as it is, right? That regulation is forcing them into renewables and forcing them into better ways of creating energy, you know, cleaner ways of creating energy, however you want to put it. But I don't think that those regulations necessarily need to be imposed on the Bitcoin mining industry because, you know, we're under that umbrella already. You know, if we want to play the game and we want to buy power, then not only are we going to have to live up to the energy company's standards, you know, we're also going to have to meet everybody's standards, whether that be OSHA or the federal government. So, you know, here's what I'll say. I, I'd hate to see an industry get killed before it gets started. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I really believe that there's a lot of good coming from Bitcoin mining, and I don't believe that things like proof of stake or or proof of space time or any proof of whatever has done better than what we've done with proof of work up to this point. Right. And if there was something out there that we could rely on that was better than proof of work, then show it to me and we'll iterate and we'll innovate on that. But until then, we're still here. We still have Bitcoin and we understand that this has solved so many problems And in addition to that, now it's creating solutions to other problems that, you know, Bitcoin wasn't going to solve, right? Now, now we have companies that are being created about around Bitcoin mining. Um, You know, let me, let me deviate a little bit. Um, Publicly traded companies, um, just like, you know, there was a time where ASICs came out and there were people that were anti-ASIC and then there were people that were saying that, you know, uh, you know, not your, not your minor, not your hash rate or not your plug, not your <laughs> hash rate. You know, like there's all these different sayings out there, right? Well, whenever it all comes down to it, I was also one of those guys that said, you know, these publicly traded companies, what do they do for Bitcoin? Right. And I asked mm. that a lot. I was like, well, you know, they mine the Bitcoin, which means that they're taking hash rate or, away from the plebs. You know, that's kind of how I was looking at it at mm-hmm. first. And as I kind of dug into it and I started working hand in, hand in hand with these guys, I started to realize, you know, Bitcoin is only one piece of the story. That's, that's not all there is to it. And if we're going to have – if we're going to be able to perpetuate Bitcoin and bring it into this, this new era that we're all looking for, the pub codes are the ones that are going to tell people why mm-hmm. and, and what it's here for, right? So – Whenever it comes down to it, I think um, I think Chad Harris does a really good job of explaining this, probably better than anybody. And at, it was actually on a, a tour of a uh, Windstone data center that it kind of struck me because, you know, the Bitcoin mining is cool, but he made it about the people and the people that work there. And that's what a big realization that I've had recently is, is that, you know, this is what the pub codes are for. It's not really about, you know, them 
holding all the Bitcoin or dumping all the Bitcoin on the open market every month, which, you know, I'd love to see them hodl a little bit more. But but whenever it comes down to it, the people is what it's about. That's why that's why these pubcos exist. That's why these bigger Bitcoin miners are, exist is it's not just about mining Bitcoin and like sucking up all the resources. It's about creating jobs, teaching people new skills, you know, showing people what financial literacy is. You know, that's a huge deal for me. I come from a place, it's, it's the poorest place in the nation. It's probably one of the most violent places in the nation. There's the least amount of outward mobility. Um, and whenever it all come down to it, I had to leave there to discover that there was a bigger world out there. Mm. And now I feel like I've discovered a technology that I could bring back to my home. And that technology would change people's lives just like it changed my life, right? Mm -hmm. But to get there, um, I'm from Louisiana originally. and But to get there, it's, it's a state-regulated system. It's in the MISO market. They're not as mature as PJM or even ERCOT. Whenever it comes down to it, for us to do any Bitcoin mining there, we have to jump through all kinds of hoops with regulation. Whereas you come to Texas and you see these these big farms popping up and, you know, nobody's telling them no. You might have to wait a little while. <laughs> you know, get, there might be a delay or two. In, yeah. 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 But nobody's telling them no, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's what I'm, I'm seeing. That's that's the big difference that I'm seeing across the board right now is that whenever you start talking about regulation and you want to try to get these senators to understand what they're doing, then all you got to do is show them the mining farm and show them the guy who was, you know, at a dead end job that he hated. And he was like, you know what, this meant everything to me. And the fact that I could just work in Bitcoin, I took the job, you know, and that that means the world to me. Isn't that so true for all of us? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure our listeners many people who may want to break into the space. All of us just started the same. Like for me, the commercial building that I was working at shuts down. I had some severance pay, came to Texas, and I'm like, what can I do? I can educate. I'll start an education company. I'll talk to anyone who will listen, right? So everybody's bringing their gift to get in. And it it also makes me think back to what you were saying at the beginning, Mm -hmm. that when even when there was no off-ramps, the big thing, the big push at that time was to spend it, right? Was mm-hmm. to help people understand and to educate the value and get them here, take some from me. And so what I'm hearing you saying about the pubcos is they're just furthering the mission of it's Absolutely. it's about education. It's about adoption. It really is a come for the gain, stay for the revolution kind right. of idea. And we're all in this together and here to help one another right. learn and and plug themselves in with whatever gift that they have. Right. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing now in the space. So you've come Mm -hmm. a long way. What are you working on now? Yeah. So um, last couple of years have been very hectic with the ups and downs. Um, What I've noticed is working with all the companies that I've worked with, I noticed that there was kind of a hole in the space for, for good site operators just in general. Um, Whenever I started talking to people that were out there, I noticed that there was a lot of energy companies that were hiring. Um, these energy companies, as they as they're hiring, you know, they're in this mode of they're still trying to kind of figure it out. You know, I, I don't think they're they're there yet, but that was kind of my my signal whenever I started seeing all these energy companies that are hiring, and you know, they're hiring Bitcoin miners. They're looking for Bitcoin experience, and there's a real shortage of that out there, right? So they are looking. Very much so. Yeah, everybody is looking for – if you have Bitcoin mining experience, and, and I would say that that experience would probably have to involve mainly very, very uh, tradesman-type jobs. So mm-hmm. electricians, network ops, um, even hardware repair. That, that's been a huge one over the past year. You know. So the program the TSDC is working on yes. would be right – aimed at absolutely exactly what the absolutely electricity companies are me and a for. couple of technicians actually got on a call with them and oh, we were able to kind of 
give them an idea of what we do. Hmm. And it was interesting to hear the instructors say, well, we've already got classes for that. So what we'll do (laughs) is we'll just pull some from this and we'll pull some from this. And then what we're going to do is we'll create a curriculum that really lines out what Bitcoin mining is. And this is, yeah. And and what that's going to do is that gives somebody a place to start. And I, I get asked more than anything else, you know, I, I read as much as I can on Bitcoin mining, but there's just not that much information out there. You know, I feel like I've read everything that I can. Can you suggest something? And mm-hmm. it's funny because the first thing I do is I, I I pull up manuals and I'm just like, here, you know, check out this manual. What kind of manual? Uh, the S19 manual, you mm-hmm. know, like, like it, and you walk people through it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's there's really interesting things in there. I mean, you know, if you don't read the manual, then you wouldn't know that if you're above a... 5,000 foot elevation, then you need to decrease the max temperature by one degree Celsius for every thousand feet. It's fascinating. Yeah. So the (laughs) cutoff temperature for an S19 is 104 degrees. Mm. But if you're at elevation, like in Colorado, um, and you're above 5,000 feet, then your cutoff temperature is more like 97 degrees. So it's, you know, these are things that whenever you're troubleshooting as a technician, you really need to know these things, you know, because let's say you're, you're in a hot data center. Like, let's hope that nobody is over 97 (laughs) degrees in there. I don't know. Texas gets pretty hot out there. (laughs) On the intake in Colorado. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, but, but what ends up happening is, you know, if this person doesn't know this, they automatically think that there's something wrong with this miner whenever there's really nothing wrong with this miner, mm. right? Yeah, it's cutting off, but it's protecting itself. So tell us what you're doing now. Uh, right now, I just started as chief operating officer for Rebel Mining Company. Uh, we have some sites in Texas, Missouri, and Wyoming. Uh, we're looking to do about 200 megawatts over the next uh, year and a half to two years. Um, mainly co-location. We're not really looking to do a lot of self-mining. I, I, I think there's a place in the industry right now for people who just want to focus on under, owning the underlying infrastructure for those Bitcoin miners and just providing a good service to serve Bitcoin miners. And is there a great need for that? Are the electric companies looking for that kind of thing? Or who are you partnering with? Who, who, who are the ones that call you up and say, hey, come create this this area into a bitcoin mining sure um believe it or not it's bitcoin miners in general you know there there are some publicly traded companies that we've dealt with um you know just like any other company there's a bunch of bitcoiners kind of in the wings pushing these these companies to invest um but mainly with uh the pubcos uh some of the hosting companies that would aggregate or decentralize some of that hash rate for the smaller miners um most of what we're doing is one megawatt plus Okay, so larger. Yeah, yeah, up to 25. We're working on a 25 megawatt site in Texas right now, and uh, we currently have about 14 megawatts operational in Missouri. Wow. And how would people get in touch with you if they're looking to hire you? Yeah, it's uh, www.rebelminds.io. And you can find me on Twitter. It's Bitcoin Neil. Well, Neil, I could sit here and hear your stories all day long. (laughs) Hey, thank you so much for taking the time with me. It's a pleasure having you here. Absolutely. And look forward to the next conversation. Same. Thank you. Hey, it's Amy. Click over here to subscribe. Click over here for more content. And we'll see you next time.